So would you help me welcome our friend, Rico Cortez. Good hey brother. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I really enjoy myself this morning sharing with you. Hopefully, the teaching now is going to be a little bit different, but hopefully be informative for you to, uh, to learn a few things about what we do and some prophetic pictures in these last days. Um, the, the temple app, I study under a gentleman named Joseph Good. He's one of the renowned temple researchers for 40 years, and I've been studying with him now 15 years. His research is based on all the temple, second temple period, and this is all based to scale. I also have the VR version of this. You can literally be inside and see the temple. It was 23 stories high, the temple building. The altar was 20 feet high. It was huge. So what we do, we teach the, uh, the New Testament and we show you a lot of the events that happened in the time of the Messiah. And we show you from the temple perspective. You know, everything is there for us to understand. And also, this, is, this app is used by one of the organizations in Israel, by some of the rabbis, teaching kids about the temple. So as you can see, we have a tool that is being used by certain people in Israel to teach about the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. And I'm delighted to be a student of Joseph Good. Um, the app is ours. We own it. The people who made the app, actually, they, they, they were the one, they work in Hollywood, um, uh, Hobbit and some of those movies. And uh, they actually love the temple and they made the app for us. Everything's to scale. We have resources. If you want to do homeschooling, you want to do a study of the New Testament, all the feasts when they're coming up in the tabernacles, um, uh, the day of Passover, how the thing was done. You can literally go walk up to all the archaeological sites that have been discovered. They also have info dots. And, and the pictures that you see in the app, there are certain places you hit a scroll, it gives you the, re the sources, archaeological sources, historical sources, uh, biblical sources, and rabbinical sources on the temple. And also we added uh, pictures, archaeological pictures that I took. And we put them in there so that if you're a student of the Bible and you want to know more about the archaeology is also readily available for you. So I pray that it's a blessing to you. Hopefully, maybe someday we'll be able to do a course on the temple and the New Testament. I do, te I do courses every year. If you go to wisdomintora.com, my website, well, I have courses, seven years of courses. We're going to have one in Indiana. And that's basically my focus the last 25 years, understanding the temple, the New Testament, and the prophetic picture of what the Bible talks about. Amen? Pastor Michael, thank you so much for having me. I'm such a having a great time with you and your family. And I'm hopefully that these teachings this morning and this afternoon will be a blessing to you. Amen? Now, the topic is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be talking about, this is in the news right now. It's called the red heifer. Para Aduma. And now we're going to be talking about that little beady red thing is causing a lot of problem right now. My tour, I take tours to Israel in English and Spanish. As a matter of fact, I think there was a sister here this morning who went to Israel with me. I don't know if she's still around, but she is. Raise your hand. You probably have to go. So she went to Israel with me in 2015. I've been taking tours to the land since 2008. And we go there every year, sometimes twice a year. And my tour, my Spanish tour, I had the opportunity to see the red heifers when they got to Israel. We were the first tour to see them. Let me give you a little bit of a background about who we are, what we do. Again, this is not bragging. I just, right now what's going on, there's a lot of misinformation of what's going on in Israel in the prophetic picture. Right now the Muslims, Hamas, they're taking this as an excuse to create, uh, to create problems and issues like that. They could care less about the red heifers because if they really cared about it, they would be going to Shiloh where they're at right now. They'll take care of it. Makes no sense. That was their excuse in order to wage war. That's what they do. But anyway, it's going to be more of a prophetic teaching right now. And I'm not a prophecy teacher because in the Bible the prophets die. <laughs> anyway, so prophecy is important. I mean, I'm glad you got the joke on that one. But, you know, it is important that we understand what, what's going to trigger the second coming of Messiah. I'm going to make a statement. And please understand where I'm coming from. Uh, uh, I don't mean to be challenging, but certain things you just don't play around with. There are certain things that are holy in nature. You have to understand what it means before we have an opinion on the matter. Right now, too many people are having opinions about this particular uh, things, and they're not really understanding what it means. So, so who are we? Joseph Good and myself. 
we are temple researchers and we are connected with the people who make the decisions. For example, we are friends with uh, Rabbi Persov. We are, are friends with uh, Rabbi Makover. Makover is actually one of the authorities of the temple in Jerusalem. We met them. We, my teacher uh, collaborates with them. My teacher has been involved with the Temple Institute since, since the 90s. He was actually involved with the first red heifer that came in in the 1990s. He was, he's involved with these people. We actually know the people who brought them into Israel. You know, we met them. Mo, and then we also met the gentleman from Texas who actually helped raise them. And normally when there's information to be known about the red heifer, I pick up the phone, I call, and I know directly from the source. So that way there's no middleman of people trying to interpret something. Now on top of that, I'm a temple researcher. My, temp, my, my teacher has been a temple researcher all this time. So we don't care about speculation or an interpretation. We care about more what it means, but you need to understand the, the, uh, the reason for the red heifer because the red heifer has been misunderstood as to think that because there will be a paraduma, the red heifer, that that would by any means do away with the work of Yeshua, our Messiah, and the plan of redemption. That only shows the lack of understanding that we have about the temple because we don't really study it. You know that is not an area of study, and that's okay. It's not for everybody. But it is for me, and I want to share with you so you would understand the prophetic timetable. Why is it that the Muslim world is so adamant about mentioning the red heifers when even the Jewish people are not really worried about that? Think about it. They use something so significant as to mention something that they themselves do not understand. And now the whole Christian world and the whole uh, speculative world and many other people are, many of them are pro-Israel and many of them are not pro-Israel because by not understanding what the red heifer represents, they are making huge mistakes because the red heifer is actually the trigger to the second coming of Messiah. Let me repeat that again. The red heifer is not a sacrifice. It doesn't require an altar. I need you to take notes. This is important. It's going to be a little different tone right now. The red heifer is not a sacrifice. I used to call it a sacrifice, and it's not. I needed to make corrections. It's not a korban. Repeat after me, korban. You should know that because in the book of Mark, chapter 7, it talks about that word. So therefore, word korban means to draw near, right? The offerings were not about death. The offerings were about coming near God. When I say sacrifice, you're thinking death. But in Hebrew, when you say korban or, uh, or offerings, it means to draw near to God. The food, the animals, was the food source for the priests and their families to eat. The blood represented life. Therefore, now you can approach God after you mess up to restore your relationship because your transgression defiled the altar and the temple. You got to clean it up. And God says, I want you to come near me. And there's a way that you can do it. This is the requirement. Now, there are certain things the Torah cannot do for you. And I've talked to people about this. The five books of Moses and the Bible by and large cannot do one thing. It cannot give you life. Only at the discretion of the great king. He's the one who determines whether or not you have life or not. You want me to prove it to you? So repeat after me. Rico. Rico. Can, you Can you prove it? Yes. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 13 verse 36 to verse 38. I want you to pay attention to these verses. And then I get into the teaching. In verse 36 it says, For David, after serving the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried with his father's unexperienced decay. In other words, he died. Right? Okay, he did not resurrect. But he whom God raised up did not experience decay. That means Yeshua, the Messiah. You call him Jesus, a Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. He he did not experience decay. He resurrected. Now, I want you to pay attention to the next few verses. Because if you really uh, grasp it, then this particular offering, oh, I'm sorry, slaughtering. That's what it's called in the Hebrew in Numbers chapter 9, verse 3. It says, shechita. It's a slaughtering, not a sacrifice. Otherwise, it would need an altar. And in the Mount of Olives, it doesn't need an altar, but a pile of wood. It's a pit. Over 1.4 tons of wood are necessary to slaughter one heifer. And it takes three days for the ashes to cool down. So this is not going to be an overnight thing. You cannot hold that 1.4 tons of wood in one day. This will be a minimum a week or two, if not less. And in the middle of it, you have to fight the Muslims. Okay? Then what it is, is you can start reading here in Acts. In verse 30, uh, 37 says, 
But he whom God raised up did not experience decay. Verse 38, important. Therefore, let it be known to you, men and brethren, that through this one, the Messiah, forgiveness of sin, pastor. Guess what the word forgiveness means there? Should I say it or should I let them go back to the first verse? To the first, okay, you need to go back to the first session. The word forgiveness there is not the regular forgiveness that you're accustomed to listening to. The word forgiveness in Greek, you can look it up, is the word aphesis. It comes from the root aphemi. It means to let go, to cancel out, to release. Release from what? Release from death. The Torah did not have the power in itself to forgive you or to restore life from the dead. The Torah and the commandments of God have the power to give you the instructions to live within the realm of holiness so that death have no authority over your life. Mm, you missed it. See, the whole sacrificial system makes more sense when you understand the purpose of the system of the offerings versus the work of God through Yeshua the Messiah, then there's not a conflict or a contradiction. It's a complementary effort because the temple is a microcosm. Repeat after me, microcosm. Of the garden on the earth. It's God's way of saying, I want you to draw near, near after Adam's sin. Therefore, you're kicked out out of the realm of life. Now the Lord says, I need you to come into my sacred space. Because the honor of God and the name of God is on the premise that he will restore humanity back to his image. Do you know that word image means idol? Bethlehem in the Hebrew. In other words, he built, a, he built Adam to be an image a representation of who God was for the purpose to keep in guard the garden. Gave him a function and a, and a, and a uh, function and a role. You're going to be my gardener. Yes? When Yeshua resurrected, Miriam went looking for him. Did she recognize him? Why? Where did she think he was? Ah, the last Adam. That means that restored of the garden, restoration. How can you restore the garden if death is still around? You getting it now? Therefore, let it be known to you, men and brothers, through this one, forgiveness or remission. By the word remission there, look it up. It's like 15 times in the New Testament. The word remission there is connected to the Hebrew word jubilee. We have been released. A permanent release. By the way, did you know that in the ancient Near East, in the ancient world, when a king was enthroned, he had to declare some uh, policies of freedom. Cyrus did it. He sent the people back to Israel. He gave them money to build the temple, to build everything. And so the way they used to declare permanent freedom was this way. They would send a message, written or through a messenger, through all the kingdom. And the messenger was from the king to let people know these people are free, to give them free passage back to their country. But then how would they know if they were truly free? They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Twitter or anything like that. They will send a messenger, and the messenger, don't miss this, the messenger would have a decree, and then they will put a staff or a tree at the gate of the city, and they will put a light at the top of the, uh, of the tree or the stick or the stake or whatever it was as a sign of permanent freedom. Isn't Yeshua the light of the world? He died on the tree. Yeah. Outside, of the, outside of the gate. Oh, you missed it. Oh, you missed it. You don't understand. You see, this is exactly why we understand why when they came out of Egypt, there was a pillar of fire leading them in the wilderness. It was a permanent sign of freedom that God has declared to his people. I got to keep going. Hallelujah. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. You know, it's a little tricky when you go to a regular church. I'm not used to being invited to churches. I kind of like, thank you so much for welcoming me. This is great. You know. And I pray that the teachings challenge you in a positive way. That you say, hey, maybe we can learn from one another. That's the whole idea. All right, so verse 38. Let it be known to you, men and brothers, that through this one forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And, listen, and from all the things which you were not able to be justified by the law of Moses. Therefore, Messiah, his resurrection was God's proclamation of your freedom that the one thing the Torah cannot give you, can give you instructions, it can give you direction, it can teach you how to be acceptable before God in ritual purity and moral purity. But even if you're morally pure and you were ritually pure, you still died. 
So that's why God makes no distinction because death is the virus that everyone suffers from. And the freedom God brings is to all people, not just Jewish people. It starts with them because to them belongs the covenant, belongs everything according to Romans and according to the Bible. We can never do away with that. But it's also to the nations to come in. So therefore, the Torah cannot justify you. Let's go one more verse and I get into the teaching. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Consequently, there is no condemnation for those who are in Yeshua the Messiah. For the law of the spirit of life is Messiah, Yeshua, who set you free from the law of sin and death. For what was impossible for the law. Remember, verse 2 is telling you free from the law of sin and death. What Adam introduced created a ripple effect to the whole cosmos. It was now you suffer and you didn't do anything. You were born and then you have to die. You're born and then you got to die eventually. Even if you live your life perfectly in order, you're going to die eventually. So where's the hope? The hope of things not seen. The, 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 the hall of fame of the dead in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. They all have the same hope. And it says this. For what was impossible for the law in, in, in that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin and condemning sin in the flesh. In order that the requirement of the law will be fulfilled in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. In chapter 7 verse 14 Paul says the law is spiritual. Meaning that now the, the commandments of God and the instructions teaches us how to live in the world out, in, outside of immorality. Therefore, you are acceptable to God. Okay? Make sense? So now, if the Torah cannot provide salvation, that's only at the discretion of the king. And I'm trying to establish a foundation before I go into the technical stuff. That's why I did the teaching this morning. The way I did it, so this will make more sense. Okay? Because it didn't matter what sacrifices were done or offerings in the temple. It could restore the relationship between Israel and God... But it could not do away with the number one problem of humanity, which was death. Let me, let me prove it to you. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. This is the Day of Atonement. I, I'm going to take the fact that you acquired us a good sign. Verse 15 and verse 16. 15 and 16 says this. Chapter 16 of Leviticus, verse 15 and 16. You might call me crazy, but since I was eight years old, Leviticus and Hebrews have been my favorite book. And he shall slaughter the sin offering. By the way, that word sin, you need to repeat with me. Sin. sin. Chatat. Say that without spitting on your neighbor. <laughs> chatat. Everybody says sin, but in reality it's purification. It's a purification offering. Now, there's two ways. Purification from transgressing a prohibited, prohibitive commandment or purification from a natural thing. Like, for example, a woman and her menstrual cycle, right? You get purified. You do a mikveh. You do a tevilah, an immersion, right? And then you can, you'll be okay. Or in the case of touching anything concerning death, now you got a problem. Because the temple cannot have any connection with death. That's the key. To understand the plan of restoration of God to humanity, understand the temple and you'll understand resurrection. You probably never heard it from that perspective before. Okay? So it says this. And he shall slaughter the sin offering, the sin goat, which is on the people, which is for the people. And he shall bring the blood behind the curtain. And he shall do with his blood as that which he did, not, uh, he did with the blood, a bull's blood. And he shall spatter it. Let me, let me just go to it. He takes this animal, so take the blood and take it to the Holy Holies and, and sprinkle in a certain place. Verse 16 is key. Watch. Verse 16 says, thus, he shall make atonement for the sanctuary from the Israelites in purity. Make atonement. So, hey guys, we got a problem. And I want to challenge you with this. Now, again, I believe in perfect faith that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. Do you believe the Messiah is Yeshua? Yes. Perfect. Okay, I believe he is the Redeemer that God sent. I believe he's that messenger that God sent, the son of the living Elohim, Ben Adam, the last Adam who will restore us and he will rule over us on the earth. Right? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen to what the verse says. Listen to what the verse says. It says, thus you shall make atonement for the sanctuary from the Israelites' impurities and from their avon. That's national guilt. 
transgressions and from all their sins so that you must do for the tent of meeting, meaning the temple or the tabernacle, which dwells with them in the midst of their impurities. Mm, we got a problem. There was atonement for sin in the Bible. Explain to me then why you need Jesus. And I bet no one haven't asked you that. And the reason why I know this is because a rabbi asked me that in Jerusalem. And you know what I have to do? Go back and study because I did not know the answer. And you need to recognize something that when we talk about the Messiah's plan of redemption, we cannot mess around disregarding the blueprint that teaches you what God will do through the Messiah. And that's what the temple teaches you. The blueprint of how God is going to restore you from the realm of death. And how does he do it? Through something physical. So therefore, the red heifer is for anything with any connection with death. And the God of Israel is life. Did I just stone you with that, with that question? I made that statement. You should have gone like, really? What? This is the reason why many people, when they start looking into the Bible and they read Leviticus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, they ask, why do we need Jesus for? There was atonement. Ask to any person who lives in Israel who understands the Torah. They'll tell you, we don't need Jesus. There's atonement. Yes, for unwillful and for impurities. And from transgressions and God on the day of atonement can give you a yearly remission. Year by year, God will give you mercy. And as a nation, he will forgive. He will give you a pardon. But then the temple is going to be destroyed. The book of Hebrews is going to be written. And now the writer of the Hebrews is trying to convey the message that if the temple is destroyed, there's never going to be an opportunity to ratify any covenant. Because the Bible clearly states that every covenant is ratified with blood. And without, the, the, without, the remission, without blood, there is no what? Offices. Hebrews 9.22, without blood, there's no remission. The word there is aphesis. The word is freedom. The word is jubilee. The same word I've been telling you all along. Are you, is this making sense? Okay, now watch this. So now when you understand there was atonement, then we ask the question. It's logical. Then why do we need the Messiah? If I understand this, then why do I believe in perfect faith, no matter what, that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel? Because I finally understood that the sacrificial system can render you clean from your impurities, even from a transgression. But then God gave you mercy to do the thing the Torah and the prophets could not do for you. Which was render you cleansed and guiltless from death. Do you see why I did the teaching this morning? Otherwise it would not make any sense. So the re now that I talked about that, I hope I didn't confuse anybody. Okay, good. It's going to get better. So now that we understand the temple has a purpose, that the Torah, the five books of Moses, according to the New Testament, it tells you it was impossible for the law to do, which was to provide life. Actually, Galatians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Go back and read it. It says it, that if there was a law that gave you life, so why do we need the Messiah? Because God will send his son to do the one thing the Torah cannot do with you based on his mercy and his grace. So that not only Israel can be restored to the covenant, but that all humanity can return to the garden. And ladies and gentlemen, you have been invited. So now, now the same God, because Paul says in his letters that we need to be uh, uh, sober. And he says in times and seasons I should not have to tell you anything about. So the question is, if Paul says that we should know times and seasons, which is actually the feast of the Lord, the Moedim, the feast of the Lord, then why are we running to and fro, scared out of our minds, because some Muslim says the end of the world is going to be tomorrow. When we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great and awesome God who gives us security and doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Why are we so afraid of the end of the world when it requires for the tribulation to come in order for Messiah to be declared victorious over the enemy and Satan no longer has authority over us? I mean, these are valid questions, right? So let's find out what the red heifer is really for. See, death is defeated by the resurrection of Yeshua. The temple was designed to teach you how God will restore you to his sacred space, the garden. Thus, nothing connected with death was ever allowed in the temple. Long hair, 
in the temple was not allowed. Why? In the ancient Near East, long hair was a sign of mourning. That's why women are not allowed to be priestesses because in the ancient Near East, that's the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Women were prostitutes of the temple. I was just in Corinth, and I went to Acro Corinth, the mountain right behind the old city. We climbed all the way up there. They had a temple of Aphrodite up there. They used to do meat sacrifice to idols and fertility rituals. That's what Acts 15 is talking about, to abstain from. Therefore, women were not allowed to be priestesses. Why? Because in the ancient Near East, as well as in the Greco-Roman world, a woman was, who was considered herself a priestess was also a prostitute. Thus, God tells the children of Israel, women are not allowed a, a, beyond a certain threshold of the temple so that the nations will not say that the women of my kingdom are prostitutes. He's preserving your honor. Ladies, you should have said amen to that one. Because he's trying to protect you. The service was conducted in silence. Why? Because they used to do divination and they used to do witchcraft. Therefore, that's not allowed. The entrails. Have you ever wondered why when you read Leviticus it says, and put all the entrails on the altar, right? I mean, the Jews, they eat liver. They eat liver. So I don't understand. So why do they eat the liver if, in fact, in the temple you were not allowed to eat the liver? Why? Because the book of Ezekiel tells you that they used to read the liver in Egypt. They did that. Balaam. Remember Balaam? When he says there's no divination of witchcraft against Israel. You know why? The text doesn't say. But when you understand the culture, he raised up the altars. Remember? He built seven altars. Remember? Remember? Yes? You know what he would do? He opened the animal, get the liver, and try to read the liver. He was a witchcraft guy. He couldn't do it. So therefore, there's no witchcraft or divination against Israel. Oh, man. Understanding his cultural background puts everything in its proper context. And you have to go back to that. So in the temple, they put the entrails on the altar to burn them up. Why? So no one would ever say there was witchcraft in the temple. Yes? See, this is what I like to teach you guys and share with you to bring the Bible a little bit more alive and understanding that what you're reading is not just a storyline about some events that happened. The reading is a storyline about your future redemption. It's about how God has managed to put everything down in a book to let you know how much he loves you, he respects you, and he wants to restore you back to his image. Amen? All right, good. I'm glad you're enjoying this. So, now watch. What is the red heifer for? Let's go through some of the things that we need to cover. Death is the reason for the separation between God and humanity. The curse of the law is death. It's not the commandments of God. I used to teach that when I was in a Pentecostal church. And I did. I did not know. And now I recognize that the curse of the law is death. God is trying to release us, release us from death. So that we obey him from our hearts with a circumcised heart in order now to come near him and understand that when we enter the garden, we cannot have death present. I read that in the verses this morning. Then you have the temple. is the microcosm of God's garden where the presence of God dwells and death does not have dominion. And I read that already in this morning. Revelation 21 verse 1 and 4. Now, are you keeping track how many verses I'm giving you already? You should. Let me tell you why. Because in these last days, speaking about these things, many people will stand up, and I've already been hearing them, speculating and scaring you out of their minds. Because we do not understand the information, so thus we worry because we are human beings. And now because we see the state of the world, we think the end is going to be tomorrow. And I need you to understand one thing. The God that I serve wants his people to be informed. He wants you to know exactly what's going to happen. And I submit to you in a positive way that if you dare believe and study these things, you will know exactly the trigger of the great tribulation and exactly the coming of Messiah. And I don't say that lightly. Because without the red heifers, the mechanism of the great tribulation cannot begin. So what we're seeing is that in your lifetime, if these heifers are able to do the slaughtering, and they do it. I don't know when, but they do it. I'm going to see them next month. I'm going to be in Israel in May, May 11th. Keep me in your prayers. When I go over there and I meet with them, then I find out if they're going to do it or not. They're not going to do it before Passover. That's not going to happen unless a miracle occurs. And then Iran just shoots themselves. Instead of Israel, they do the Temple Mount and then poof. They do their job for us. Okay. 
Next, the whole city of Jerusalem is supposed to be holy and clean from corpse impurity. Repeat after me, corpse impurity. That's the essence of the red heifer. The red heifer was to purify you. And that's the mystery. If you had any connection with death, either if you, st if you stepped on a sepulcher, if you touched somebody who touched a dead carcass, if you went into a house that had a dead person, if you touched the dead, then you are ritually unclean. You didn't do anything wrong. You're not going to go to hell. It's just that you cannot go into the temple proper. You can go into the temple mount, but you cannot go into the temple inside because nothing connected with death can go inside. Is this making sense? Good. Okay, so then, these are the steps you need to know. Nothing connected with death could enter into God's sacred space. We already know that the only time when God is going to come to the earth is after the thousand years, the book of Revelation tells us, and that death will be no more. Because death, if God comes down to earth right now, we will cease to exist. Because we will be completely annihilated by the presence of God alone. Because of our mortal bodies. Now, it's interesting because what drove Adam from the garden? What action did he do in order for him to be expelled from God's temple, his garden? You see, the problem is we never connect the garden uh, in Eden as a temple. The scholars, Wainfeld, Moshe Wainfeld, Finham, MacArthur, all those guys, Kitchen, a lot of these guys, they understand that the temple... It's actually the garden and the first three chapters in the book of Genesis is written in, as a temple text. The book of Genesis begins the way the book Revelation ends. The book of Genesis ends the way the way the, way the book of Revelation begins. Let me repeat that. It starts with a garden. It ends with a garden. Book of Genesis ends with the dispersion to Egypt. It ends with a tabernacle. Uh, I mean, the book of Revelation begins with the seven churches that are scattered abroad. The book of Exodus begins with the exile into shame, into Egypt. The book of Exodus ends with the tabernacle and the presence of God in the tabernacle, Eden restored. That's the message. Eden is restored. Israel is restored back to its proper place. And then idolaters sit in. And then the presence of God is removed again. Are you with me? Say hallelujah if you got it. Therefore, nothing touching the dead person. Entering the house recently of a dead person. Touching a person who touched a dead corpse. Lepers. Ooh, lepers. What was the first sign given to Moses to show the Israelites? Two things. The staff turning into a, a, a nachash, a serpent, right? Oh, you like this one, pastor. I'm going to say it. Yeah, I'm going to say it. Check this out. God tells Moses, two signs for Israel. Put your hand in the bosom. It turned into. What did it turn into? Leprosy, that's death. There's no cure for leprosy. Okay, so now he puts it back in the bosom and then it's healed. The message of you will be healed from death. Oh, you missed it. All right, then the next one was the staff, Pastor. The staff was a serpent. But when Moses goes to Pharaoh, he uses a different word than Nachash. He used the word Taninim. Taninim is Leviathan. Taninim is the dragon. Taninim is the fish and Jonah. Taninim is actually the underworld God. So there was a cosmic battle in which God is telling Israel, I will heal you of your, perma of your exiled. I will heal your leprosy. And in healing you, I will destroy the power of death. Tanim. Now, you see, it was a serpent to Israel because the power of Pharaoh, he had a Uraeus in the headdress. The serpent, the same prophecy in Genesis chapter 3. You see what I'm saying? So the message of resurrection uh, is right from the get-go in the story of the redemption of Egypt. Isn't that cool? It's amazing. So now, how did I cut on to this? I keep tabernacles. I do the Feast of Tabernacles. On the last day of Tabernacles, we break down the sukkah. That means the, the tent. Okay? And there's a prayer that goes along with it. And every Orthodox Jew does it every year. But I asked a few of them. They don't know why. So they say, may it be your will, O Lord our God, King of the universe, that next year we build our sukkah with the skins of Leviathan. That's the fish. That's the underworld dragon. That's the one defeated in the book of Revelation. That's the one Job is talking about. Mm, his resurrection message. 
That means that the feast, Pente uh, Passover, is about redemption. Why do they eat the lamb? Because the lamb uh, in Egypt was a sign of Kanum. Kanum was the god of the underworld, was the god of fertility. He was actually the potter of humanity. He, they believed that the Kanum, the god of the Egyptians, he actually created humanity out of clay. Hmm, Genesis 1 says, nah, -uh, it's not Kanum, it's the god of Israel who created Adam and gave him life when he blew into him the breath of life. By the way, that's resurrection message right there. We were dead in our trespasses, and when we accept the Messiah was resurrected by God, then God gives us his Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, the wind of God. Just like he did with Adam, he revived you with no purpose, with no role, and then he made you a gardener in his garden. That's why the red heifer is so significant in the temple. Because if the temple in the realm of death, which we live in right now, we live in the realm of death. If the, red, if the temple was representing perfection and purity, where well, death cannot exist. By the way, did you know that the word avodah, working in the temple of the priest, you ever wonder why they were white? They were supposed to represent the perfection of humanity and creation. And that's exactly what God told Adam to do. I want you to shomel ve. I want you to guard and work in the garden. The temple was designed as a garden. Did you know that? It had four veils in the first century. It didn't have one. You know one of them rented, right? We talk about that one all the time. Do you know how tall that was? 76 feet high. It was this thick. Take 300 priests to bring it down. You know, the lentil for that veil... The estimated value of the gold today is $15 million. Josephus gives you the, the weight of the gold back at the time, and then you can put the price of the gold today. But, but the reason is, why did the veil rent it? And it's all connected with this, by the way. Because, you see, we were expelled from the garden. And the scholars called the threshold liturgy. There's a, lit there's a threshold in the temple that only man can go so far, and the priest can go to a high level. Because... Beyond that point, no man can go unless they're called, sanctified, dedicated, and anointed like the priests were to work for God. But the, the laws of purity were out of this roof, were very high. The veil rented. And I used to teach that it was because God was mourning for the loss of his son. That's, a, that's an impossibility because mourning was not allowed in the temple. That's why the priests were not allowed to rent their garments. Aaron was not allowed to do so. And that's why he did not eat of the offerings his sons there in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Why? Because if he would have eaten that offering at that time, then it would have appeared that they were doing apotopreg worship, worship of the underworld. And Aaron knew this, and he refused to let his sons eat it because he was in deep mourning. Everything has a reason. The veil rented. It was four veils, one in the opening of the, uh, on the, on the, rechal, the, opening of the door, one Two veils between the holy and the holy of holies. And one in the roof. Second story. Four. Now the reason why I rented is because the death of Yeshua, remember, it turned dark for three hours, right? Darkness represents what? Death. Darkness for three hours. And then the veil rented. When it rents, it's making the way back to the garden. Because inside the temple in the holy place, you have the menorah. The candlestick. The candlestick is designed as the almond tree, right? The staff of Moses, remember? The almond tree. And what's interesting is the book of Revelation says that those who believe in Yeshua and keep the commandments of God would have the right to eat of the tree of life. And the book of Revelation says that those who eat of the tree of life will be bring healing to the nations. Question, what healing you think he's talking about? Healing from the only thing there's no solution for, which is death. That'll preach. Yeah? So now we know why we need to learn about the menorah. Yes? Man, I'm having a great time. So why do we need this thing? Why do we need that little, uh, they're cute too, I saw them. And I'm looking, I'm going like, poor little girl, which one? One, two, three, which one are you going to die for us? 
Not for us because we already had that atonement. I'm talking about when one of them died and is slaughtered on the Mount of Olives, he doesn't require an altar. By the way, fake news. They're showing you on CBS News an altar, right? Fake. That's a metal altar. It's not even in the Mount of Olives. It's ridiculous. I cannot believe these recorder, reporters don't even know their stuff. And worse, believers in the Messiah continue to repeat false information. We can have it both ways, guys. We cannot pretend to say we love the Messiah and then go completely against something that he himself, the Messiah, would never do away with. We can have it both ways. The altar is not required for the, for the red heifer. Only a pit and the wood. And then you have hyssop, scarlet yarn, and then you have hyssop. Why hyssop? Corpse impurity. That's why they had it in the Exodus. Then they have it in the ritual for the leper. So what you do now, let me show you the steps. Prophetically, now let's get into prophecy. I said I'm not a prophet, but I'm still not. The prophetic requirements for the second coming of Messiah. I, I run this by my teacher. We make sure that we went through all this stuff, Pastor. We don't want to teach anything that is wrong. And I, I make you a promise. If I share something with you that is wrong, I promise you I will rectify it and I'll come back and I'll fix it and I'll tell you that I'm wrong. No, that's not a problem. Okay, we need to be accountable and we need to be willing to say, God, you know, I was trying to do the right thing and I was not informed and make it better. So please do your, do your research and validate what I say. Now, these are the steps. The red heifer, red heifer, say between three and five years old. That's, it depends on the argument which rabbis. Now, I've seen the five one. Three were eliminated. There's two that are still available right now. Two that are available for slaughter. Not a sacrifice, a slaughter. In the Hebrew, we say korban, it doesn't say that. It says shchita. It's like a slaughter, completely different. All right? Second, the ashes of the heifer served as corpse impurity. The reason why you need the ashes is so that the temple will be able to be purified. Not the temple, but the area. Okay, there's an argument right now among the rabbis whether or not you need the ashes to build the altar because the stones does not absorb corpse impurity. That's another topic in itself. But the priests, they need to be able to be sprinkled. If you go up for the feast, by the way, Zechariah says that we will celebrate tabernacles in the millennial reign, doesn't it? Well, wait a minute. If you come from the nations and you touch something unclean, you got to go through the process, even in the millennial reign. Because it's not about your salvation. That's already been given to you freely by, Yeshua, by, by God through Yeshua the Messiah. It's about entering God's sacred space. Okay, let me put it to you this way. Does it get really hot here in the summer? Yes. I've been here before. It's terrible. It's a beautiful place. Just Florida is worse. Okay, you know. okay, so you have a husband who's working in the yard all day long. Man, he's melee. He comes in the house and says, honey, I want to give you a hug. Are you going to give him a hug? You're already laughing. You know that's not going to happen. You're going to, the ladies, what's the first thing you're going to say? Ah, stop. Take a. Thank you. Now, after, that's ritual impurity. That would be considered ritual impurity. But let's take the extreme. The guy that or the person that you're married to decides to cheat on you. Not only cheat on you, he does it with your best friend. Not with your best friend only, but then he has sex in your marriage bed. And then he wants to come to you wearing an Armani suit, the most expensive cologne with the best shoes. And then he says, honey, I want to give you a hug and be intimate to you. Ladies, you're going to say, get out of my, get out of my house. Why? Because he looked perfect on the outside, but inside he was morally impure and you want nothing to do with him. The same way worked in the temple. If you t touch something unclean, not a problem. Take a shower. It's called mikvah and immersion. But if you commit moral sin, get out of my house. It's death for you. And then there's no offerings for willful rebellion sin. So where's your hope? Get it? So Adam and all those people died with the hope that God will vindicate them. Because sh and death is shame. So therefore, the red heifer is all about how God is going to restore his sacred space. Because in order for the Antichrist or the false Messiah to be revealed, what does the false Messiah need to do? Come on now. You all quote it. He needs to sit in the temple as if he is God, right? But the thing is, it doesn't say he has to sit in the temple building. 
See, what you need to remember is that the priest could, I'm sorry, that the king of Israel, of the line of David, and we have a descendant of David here. I'm honored to meet you. Okay? Okay, so what it, what's interesting is that the king of Israel, only the line of David, could sit in an area specified for him, north of the altar in the court of Israel. So the court of Israel was 11 cubits by 135 cubits. Right in front of me, right here is the altar, 20 feet high, 100 feet long. In front of me is the building, 23 stories high with a huge veil. And the, pre, I mean the, the king can enter into the court of Israel and sit somewhere north of the altar looking towards the temple. The question is, ask me, why can he sit and no one else? I'm glad you asked. The reason is because he is called the prince of God on the earth. He's the king to Israel, but he's the prince of God. He's ordained, appointed, and anointed by God to become the king of Israel. Thus, he can sit in the king's table and the king's court as his prince. But the priests and Israelites cannot sit in that area. Because you don't sit in the presence of the king. If you go back to ancient Near East, you see that the king is sitting on the throne and his son is to the right hand. That's why the Bible in Hebrew says that now he is sitting at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. That is an idiom of the hierarchy in which now Messiah is sitting, waiting until all the enemies are put under his feet. That means that he's coming to rule and reign. And we are his kingdom. Is this making sense? Okay, so now watch. Now that you understand that, you need to know first, the ashes represent purity from corpse, from anything touching death. We're not talking about the plan of redemption of Yeshua and salvation. That's something completely different because we already explained that the Torah cannot provide salvation. It can give you a purification from your unintentional or even willful but unintentional sins. Not rebellious sin. Okay, willful meaning this way. Have you told the kid, don't touch the jar, don't eat the cookie? And then they look at it and you go away and they look at it and then they eat it. And they go, I just, it just, I just, it just happened. Because the weak of the flesh causes us to do that. So that was a willful and then you repented, you brought a guilt offering. Okay, so therefore, now in the temple, what you will do, you needed to understand that once the altar is dedicated, you know how many days it takes for the altar to be dedicated? Eight days. How many of you know about Hanukkah? Raise your hand if you know about Hanukkah. Hanukkah has been told to us that it's the miracle of the oil. That's the legend. Hanukkah is eight days and the ninth branch is the one that starts all the other, the other branches. It's this, it's the light starter. Okay. The reason why it's eight branches, nine, but eight are the main ones, is because it takes eight days to dedicate the altar. The whole Hanukkah is about the dedication of God's authority on the earth. When Noah came out of the ark, what was the first thing he built? An altar. When Abraham entered the land, what was the first thing he built? When he went to Egypt and returned, what was the first thing he did? When Israel came out of Egypt, what was the first thing they did? Get it? So in order for the restoration of God's authority to be declared on the earth, because the master of the world today is who? Satan. Perfect. So we have to have a transferring of authority. How does that happen legally? By erecting God's altar that represents God's authority and table. And when someone who is illeg illeg illegitimate tries to eat of it and sits in the courts he's not supposed to, now he creates an affront, a legal judicial case against God. And then God says, I'm the master and I'm the judge. He declares war on the false Messiah and all his followers. You need to follow this. This is all about the end times. Did I present it to you in a different way? I can give you the details and be very technical, but if I don't connect it like this, it's not going to make sense. So now we now, the red heifer takes three days for the ashes to burn through. 1.4 tons of wood, for, if I remember correctly, to be able to slaughter and the temperatures goes up to 1,000 degrees in order to, to, to burn it. Then you have to get the ashes. And we don't know when we'll be able to build the altar because the, the dome of the rock cannot be there. And by the way, this whole thing that, you know, you can put the altar and you can put the, the moss, al which is actually south. The dome of the rock is not a moss, by the way. The dome of the rock is a sacred space marker. When I went to uh, the Acropolis in Greece, I saw how the Acropolis became a church during the Byzantine period and later became a mosque during the Muslim period and then a church again. 
is the way that people did in the ancient Near East. If I defeat your country and then I defeat your people, this is what they will do. First, they will rape all the women. Next, they kill all their men. Then they destroy their temples, shaming the lineage, shaming their God, shaming their king. That's why the Muslims do. ISIS, that's exactly what they did. So therefore, the temple mount is sacred space to the Jewish people. That is where the temple was. So the Muslims did exactly what the Romans did. The Romans actually built the temple of Jupiter right on the spot. Then the Byzantine period, they built a church on the same spot. And then the Muslims came 600 years later, and, you know, after the first century, and they built a mosque. I'm sorry, the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock. It's not a, it's not a mosque. It's a marker of sacred space. They know it belongs to the Jewish people. They know it was a temple. They don't want to say it. I go to Israel all the time, and I take you to the Temple Mount. Guys, listen, let me tell you another thing. Don't be afraid to go to the land. Okay? Remember the ten spies? Remember God, uh, Moses sent 12 spies and 10 gave a bad report? What happened to them? Because the land is the inheritance and the land is the gift. And the gifts of God are without repentance. That means that when God gives you a grant and a gift, no one can take it away. Iran can attack. Russia can attack. The Muslims can attack. But no one can ever get rid of Israel because God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. First, the red heifer has to require by an age. Right now we have them. We're just waiting for the proper thing. The purpose of the heifer is the ashes for corpse impurity, to cleanse the kingdom from their iniquities, and in this sense, for their impurities that defile sacred space. It has nothing to do with our salvation. That's a gift of God. Put that on the side. Is this making sense? Okay, next. Then you have to clean the temple mount of corpse impurity. By the way, there are kings of Jordan buried on the western wall. Did you know that? By the way, did you know, how many trees do you see on the Temple Mount? The book of Numbers tells you that trees are not allowed near the altar. They cannot be there. Do you think it's going to take one day for them to just take all the trees out? If the dome is not there, they have to cleanse everything and they have to get rid of all the trees before one stone of the altar can be placed. By the way, where do you place it? Where was the temple? You need to know exactly where the temple was because the instructions of the temple are very precise. And I can tell you where it is. On the southeast, on the southeast corner of the temp, uh, Temple Mount platform where the mosque is, there's sister number 28. Number 28 has a little conduit that leads directly to the southeast corner where the temple once stood. The Mishnah tells you, we now know within inches where the temple building was. And once we know the temple building was, we count the certain cubits and we know where the altar was. We know where it is. All we need is for everything to be cleansed. You know the cisterns, there's over 30 cisterns on the Temple Mount. Khan Rashik, uh, Charles Warren, and uh, all those people, they surveyed every single one of them. One of the cisterns is bigger than three Olympic pools. It's cistern number three. You see, it's not just saying, Jesus is coming. It's not just saying, oh, the Jews, they're going to build something. No, you don't understand the mechanism because it's dealing with holy things. Anything built on the Temple Mount is separated. Kadosh Kadoshim, holy or holies. Ezekiel 43 verse 12 tells you, everything on the Temple Mount is most holy. In Hebrew is holiest of all, meaning that you don't play around with that stuff. If you touch it, you touch it with God's holiness. It's like somebody messing with your wife. Because you're married into a covenantal relationship. I tell people all the time, hey, I'm a nice guy. Don't touch my family. I'll pray for you afterwards. <laughs> you don't play with my wife. I'll run through you. Because if my master Yeshua was willing to die on our behalf, why can I not do the same for my wife and take care of her? Hello? All right, so now, red heifer has to qualify within a certain age. The ashes serve for a purpose, for you to be purified if you touch anything unclean of dealing with death. Because the temple is sacred space. Again, salvation is over here. I'm not talking about that. I got a question for you. When Yeshua resurrected, did the disciples stop going to the temple? Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John went up to the temple to the hour of prayer. You know what was going on at 3 o'clock at the hour of prayer? Offerings. 
you find them in Numbers chapter 28, verse 1 through 6. In the book of Acts chapter 20, 18, verse 18, Paul takes a Nazarite vow. He shaved his head in Sencria, which is about 15 minutes from Corinth. Because he made a vow, Nazarite vow. It requires three offerings. In chapter 20, he says that he needed to go to Pentecost. Wait a minute, that's 25 years after Yeshua died and resurrected. Why is Paul going to the temple to bring offerings and do a Nazarite vow 25 years after Yeshua died and resurrected? And then in chapter 21, James, the brother of our master Yeshua, tells Paul, Yo, Paul, do me a favor. Take four men and purify yourselves and then do the Nazarite vow. That includes 15 animals and five baskets of unleavened bread. Acts chapter 20, uh, 21, verse 30 and 35 tells you specifically the procedure. After the days of purification, after the days, it's eight days. And then he had to bring the offering to the temple. That's when he got arrested. So the question is, why would they go to the temple if Jesus died and resurrected and then everything's done away with? Because it had nothing to do with the work of redemption that God did through Yeshua. Remember, it's something that the Torah cannot do what God did with the Messiah. Is that making sense? That's why I read you those verses. But the temple is the household of God. If the White House is destroyed today, what would happen to the world economy? I know I'm here in the right place, but let's stay focused. It's for the sake of the purpose. If the White House is destroyed today, what message would that meant to the world as America as a power? It's eliminated because the house of authority and power is gone. So if the temple is gone, then who knows who is the owner of the universe? That's why the temple is so significant. The moment the altar is restored, the authority of God as the master and creator is restored. Now the enemy does not want the, the battle that would ensue for the dominion over the earth. And we are the witnesses that should be proclaiming the victory. The altar is erected. And the moment the, or, the altar is erected, you just buy, you buy your big bag of popcorn. Don't speak against the altar, guys. I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Please don't. Don't do that. If you don't understand all these mechanisms, I got you. I understand. If you, I, I'll share it with you. Don't speak against it. Because the altar belongs to God. And I already showed you that blood on the altar is not to atone for what Yeshua did. It's two different things altogether. It's not in contradiction. If we don't know the differences, that's why I still believe in the temple and this function. I believe in Yeshua more than ever. Explain that to me. So therefore, when you see the altar being erected, it takes eight days. But before the altar is erected, you need to slaughter the animal. That's going to take three, four days to get everything ready. And then you have to clean the whole temple mount. That's going to take another week. It's not going to be overnight. If you hear somebody telling you, oh, they're about to slaughter the red heifer on the temple mount, they don't know what in the world they're talking about. Because you don't do it on the temple mount, you do it on the Mount of Olives. See, if they tell you, no, they got an altar all ready for it. They don't know what they're talking about because it doesn't require an altar. And the altar they're showing in the news is actually a reenactment altar that they've been using for the last 15 years to show the people how things were done. Nothing slaughtered, no blood is shed, no animal is killed. It's a teaching tool. But because we don't know these things, we believe anything the news tells us. Haven't we learned the last four years about the news and how bad they are? So seek from the proper sources. Go do your research. How much time I got, Pastor? I don't want to go over. Okay. I, I, I'm very respectful of the time. So what's interesting is now that we know the altar will be erected. It takes eight days. Once the eight days, then that altar is an official altar to God. Now, all you need to do, we got the red heifer. Check. We got the ashes. Ashes. Check. Wait a minute. <clears throat> we needed the space on the Mount of Olives. Well, guess what? There's a community, there's actually an organization that owns the space where they used to slaughter the red heifers back in the first century. So we have the piece of land. We need to now just get the proper opportunity to get it set up. Red heifer, check. Piece of land on the Mount of Olives, check. We got the priest. The Temple Mount just announced a young man, 15 years old. Who qualifies as a qualified person in order to slaughter it. Why? Because he's never had any corpse impurity. He was born in a house, never been to a hospital. He is not the Messiah. They never said he's the Messiah. 
That's what's in the news right now, especially in the Spanish world. Oh, this is a possible Messiah. No, he's just a young kid who's a Cohen, who's a priest of the line of Aaron, who has qualifications to do this, the, the, the slaughtering. You need that young man to stay ritually cleansed because if that red heifer is not slaughtered and if the altar is not built, Messiah is not going to be able to come. You say, Rico, how can you be so sure? That's very concrete. These are the laws of the temple. Don't stay quiet. Go back and look it up. Now, once they build the altar, they have the offerings, they have priests. I saw the stones they're going to be using. Okay. Then all you got to do is wait. The world's going to go into serious chaos. Your own brothers and Messiah are going to start arguing with you and fighting with you. Can I make a suggestion? Defend God's word. And even if you don't understand this, say, uh, I don't quite understand what's going on, but I'm for it. Because you learn today that the Torah could not do for you what God did by resurrecting his son. So they're not in opposition. Is this making sense? I want to make that point so critical for you to get it. Because if you don't understand the differences, then it seems to be a contradiction. Okay? All right. That's why Yeshua needed to die outside the camp. Because if the temple service could provide that atonement for death, then why did he die outside the camp and not inside the temple? Because the sacrifices or the offerings inside the temple was for own willful sin or the transgressions that will defile the temple. Now that will cause you to die because there was atonement. But you're still going to die anyway. Yes? <laughs> A little too heavy? Okay. Once you understand the measurement of the altar, we know how to measure it. How do we know? The altar of Ezra's time, when they came back from Persia, it functioned 20 years before Haggai came in and prophesied, finish the temple, guys. Have you ever gone through the timetable, the time of the Persian Empire? They released the Jews and when they finished the construction of the temple? The story of Esther is in the middle of all that stuff. I don't have time to talk about that. But they had an altar functioning and the building was not finished. You do not need the whole building in order for the altar to be valid. Because there was an altar on Mount Sinai. Yes? Was there a temple built at that time? No, it was official. The mountain was the temple of God. That's where the presence of God was. And by the way, the same division of the tabernacle, the court of Israel, the court of the, I'm sorry, the court of, uh, of Israel, the holy place, and holy holies, the same division you see on Mount Sinai when God called Moses and Aaron. Seventy men, the people could not go beyond the threshold, put a fence around it. Anyone touches us, die. Sacred space. Especially if you touch some dead. Then Moses went up with 70 elders. The 70 elders went up to a certain place. And they were eating there. They stopped. Then Joshua came with Moses. And then Joshua stayed behind and Moses went up. That's the same separation as the temple. Now, you want something really cool? Say, Rico, I want something really cool. Have you ever wondered why when you come to the gospel you feel lonely? And this is what we all say, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. And I'm in my desert experience, yes? You wanted to come near God. You see, in the temple, you go from the court of Israel, I'm sorry, from the court of the Gentiles, everyone can be in that area. You cross a threshold, only the Israelites can go in. Then you go to the next place. Only the Israelites and the women can go in. Then you go up to the next step. From this, the court of the women... To the court of Israel, 15 steps. The sons of ascent. The sons of ascending unto God. 120 to 134. Go read them. 15 steps dividing the court of the women to the court of Israel. Teaching you how to ascend to a higher level of holiness. From all the nations to all the Israel and the women to the men of Israel. Then there's another step right here. Three cubits high. Only the priests, the Levites can stand here. The Israelites could not stand here. The Levites are higher in holiness than the Israelites. Right? And then there's another cubit over here where the priest could stand. So now you have the nations, Israel, the women, the men, the Levites, the priests. Ooh, you got to go up 12 steps to the holy place. Only 12 priests can go in daily by lots. But only one guy can go into the holy holies once a year. The closer you get to the presence of God, the lonelier it will be. You cannot take people with you. 
You got to go up on your own. Go up the steps because you want to serve and approach God. You can't just take people with you. Follow the cloud. Don't follow the people. Hey, you want to follow me? No. Okay, I'll pray for you. Can I help you? If you fall, just keep walking. No, I want to go back to Egypt. Are you sure? No, there was food and there was vegetables. You were a slave, dude. No, I want to go back to Egypt. Are you sure? The promised land is over there. No, I want to go back. It's comfortable. I feel comfortable. I feel good. It makes me feel good. Okay, go back. I'm going back over here. Because you see, through the wilderness experience, I will be tested. I will be lonely. I will be hungry. But yet, God will protect me. He will provide for me. He will feed me. And then I'll cross the other side. When I cross the river, I defeated death. And now I enter God's sacred space, the garden. That's what the temple is trying to teach you. How to return to the garden. If you speak against his throne and his temple, you are rejecting the blueprint of how he wants to restore you from your coarse impurity, from death, which was already taken care of by Yeshua's resurrection. But now the prophetic picture is the world needs to see at a grander scale how God will vindicate his people for being oppressed by the accuser. And then when we crawl out to God and say, Lord, save us, then he will send his son in a twinkling of an eye, riding on the clouds of heaven to transplant us back to the land of Israel. It's about restoration. <clears throat> I got five minutes. Dedication. Then you start the daily offering. Daily offering needs to be defiled. It's a fire on the altar. The tamid. It's not necessarily the slaughtering of the animal, which is included in that. But it's more than just the slaughtering. The tamid is the morning offering. The afternoon is the mincha. It's a daily offering that must be done. And in Exodus chapter, uh, Numbers 28 verse 6 says, it was ordained by God on Mount Sinai. Please go back and look this up. Now watch. I'll be done. 7 and 8. The priesthood. We have them. Sanhedrin. It's already in place, but they don't have any judicial authority because Israel is a secular government. You have the offerings. They can still do them. They're getting ready for that, but they're not, they can have the building today. The Jovel, the Jubilee. Yeshua comes in a Jubilee year. The Bible clearly says, Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31. He tells you with the sound of the great trump. You got three trumpets in the Bible, Pentecost, the trumpet. The last trumpet is Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets. And the great trump is the sound that you will blow after the service of Yom Kippur when you declare freedom of the Jubilee to all of Israel. The language is there. Now watch. Then the importance of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is the place where Messiah will put his feet. Yes, but in order for him to come and put his feet there, we have to go through the process, the legal requirement for Messiah to come. First, the false Messiah must challenge the authority of God and his house and his throne. Once that's happened, then the, the tribulation starts and then the people will be persecuted. And then when that goes on, then we can just know exactly how many days from the time the Tamid in Daniel 12, 11 is defiled. He tells you how many days it is. Before the coming on the great day of the Lord. The coming on the great day of the Lord in the Hebrew reckoning is an idiom for Yom Kippur. The day of judgment. Did you get something out of this today? Now, you may be saying, Rico, that's a lot of information. Yes? And you say, I'm overwhelmed. I don't quite understand. To be honest with you, I did it on purpose. To show you how much... We need to understand these foundations. So when you hear the news on TV telling you there's an altar and the priest is going to be the Messiah. Or they can do it on the temple mount. Or they can do this. You say, wait a second. It's not that simple. There's a procedure. There's a protocol. And there are ways that God prescribed that no man can change. And sometimes we are pushing to be first instead of pushing to be right. And we can't do that. As the kingdom of God, Pastor, we owe it to the, to the Lord to e equip ourselves. And that's my job. I will do whatever it takes to share what I know so that you will be informed about the latter times, the latter days. If I'm wrong in something, I'll let you know. I wasn't concerned with the eclipse. 
It's a sign of the times. I got it. Phenomenons will happen. I get it. But we are not to be moved by those things for fear. We are to pay attention for them as signs. But then you have the Muslims attacking us. That's a fulfillment of Psalm 81, I think it is, or Psalm 83. I can't remember. The enemies of God. So I'm expecting it. So the thing is this. Eventually, the Muslims are going to make a mistake. They want to bomb Israel. We already know that the hand of God is over Israel already. We got it. They will suffer. They'll go through it. Got it. But eventually, they'll make a mistake, and one of those bombs is going to redirect right to the Temple Mount. And maybe they're going to destroy the, 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 the Dome of the Rock by themselves. They'll blame, the, they'll, they'll blame the Jews anyway. But then there's going to be some kind of war that's going to be so quick, all hell's going to break loose. And then the Jews are going to say, okay, we're victorious. And something's going to happen that the mosque will be gone. When that happens, start taking notes. Then you say, red heifer, check. It was slaughter. We got the ashes. Check. We have the temple mount. Ooh, big check. It was slaughtered on the pit on the Mount of Olives. Check. Oh, by the way, this, the, the red heifer needs to be looking west, and the feet have to be pointing in a particular way in order to be legitimate. So if the face is looking east and the feet look in the wrong direction, I can tell you that's not right. And I don't care how many ashes you get, it will never be accepted. Then I'll know what it is and what it's not. Now you're not easily deceived anymore. Because you're following the steps that God. But you cannot do that if you reject the thing that teaches you how to tell the times and seasons, which is his temple, his feast, and his commandments. Okay, so now you have the, the red, red heifer to encapsulate everything. You got that. You got the temple mount, uh, the Mount of Olives. You got that. You got the ashes. Now you have the temple mount. You cleanse it. In other words, you clean it up from the trees, from all that stuff. Then you build the altar. You start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Altar to God. And then sit and wait for the first person who comes in and he tries to stop the, the, the service. The guy who stops the service and he sits, that's the false Messiah. Get ready because Messiah is coming right immediately the days after that. Then you know where you're at. Now, the day of the hour, you don't know. But the times and seasons, you do. And this teaches you that. Pastor, come on up, please. I want to thank you. <clears throat> I want to I wanna thank you, Pastor. Because I've been studying. My student knows so much the last 15 years. I've been doing this 25. And I spend six hours, seven hours a day reading, studying, researching, validating. That doesn't make me smart. I just love God. And I want his kingdom to be informed. And when I see the kingdom running to and fro and scared, I'm thinking, are we revealing who the true God is or are we shaming who our God is by our fear? He's given us a blueprint. He's given us instructions. He's given us a way to know exactly his master plan from the beginning. Don't reject God's house. Study it. Live it. Look into it. You have nothing to lose. And I, and I, and I recommend you do. If you dare to do so, some things may shock your theology at first. But eventually you're going to say, ah, it makes sense. But God says, that's my throne where I will sit and lay my feet forever. And when Messiah returns, it tells us, Pastor, that we will go up to worship the king on the mountain and his temple. So is that a contradiction that we do away with the one thing that we have to do when Messiah returns? So either we're wrong or the Bible is wrong. And I recommend more than likely we are wrong. And I don't want to be part of that problem. I want you to be informed. When you see the news, you say, I see they're afraid, but the God that I serve keeps me informed. These are the steps. And trust me, pretty soon, when people think we're crazy, they're going to be knocking on your door. Hey, how come you're not concerned? Of course I am. I'm scared, but I know what's going to happen next. And then all of a sudden now you're working in the spirit of prophecy. Is that because you are inventing things or because you're following the blueprint that pastor now allows you to guide the flock to the place of protection. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. And I want to thank you for the privilege and the honor to address your audience. My brothers and sisters, I pray that today is challenging in a good way. 
I don't proclaim to know at all. But I do know one thing. And I will stand on that forever. That Adonai Hu Elohim, the God of Israel, he is God. And there's none other. He sent his son so that you and I can partake of the blessing of eternal life. We owe him loyalty. We owe him faithfulness. We owe him reverence. Study his house. Learn about his protocols. Your life will change for the better. If only we dare to do it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you for the privilege. I pray that it has been edifying to you. And thank you for so welcoming me. I know that was a lot of information. I get that. I'm still kind of reeling myself right now, trying to piece these pieces together. Beautiful job, a lot to cover. And I know you didn't cover all of it. And we're already at 104, and I get that. But I'm going to bring you back again so we can get some more detail. And I highly recommend you watch the first service online because it really ties us together so beautifully. But let me ask you a question. And we, we briefly talked about this in the office, but what you saw last night and what you're seeing right now, what is your feeling for what your study shows you yeah. where we're sitting right now? Okay, prophetically, we know we're in the last days. We know that. What's happening right now needs to happen because the God of Israel is the one that's going to protect Israel, not in the United States. So America must remove this protection in order for God to reveal himself as the one and sole protector of Israel. We just pray that it doesn't happen in our lifetime. Yeah. But if it does, please pray that God will give the strength to the covenantal people. Because what's going to happen to them will reach us here. Okay? So what I see is all the nations are coming together. The enemies of God are revealing themselves by the day. You don't want to become one of those. So therefore, it's your time to say, what is going on? I've never seen this before. So then you focus on the things that you can understand to follow the end times. Don't get busy with the news that is creating confusion. Find out the steps necessary to know what's coming next. I know what's coming next. The war will come in such a way that something will happen that the temple mount will be restored. Don't ask me how it's going to be. I don't know. But it will happen. When that temple mount is restored and we still have the red heifer. Now, if we don't have the red heifers, reset. Yeah. We just wait. Well, you made a point earlier, and, I, and I've actually said it before, is that on October 7th, some of the truth came out about the attack, and some of the truth I heard was, read about, was concern for the al Mosque that's sitting on the Temple Mount was motivation for their attack on that day as a part of their motivation. Like, in other words, there was feeling that the mosque was going to be destroyed in some way or something was happening. So what's your thoughts on that? I think it's an excuse for them to justify their behavior. I don't care who you are, but what they did, I have videos it's, that it was not shown to the media. And I wish they would have. Because the Jewish people are too nice sometimes. They didn't want to release it. For the, for the sake of the respect of the dead. But what I saw was despicable. I'm telling you. When you see the outrage of all the Jewish nation. To the point it's like you know something happened. And you don't know what really happened. The news didn't show you. You see what the Palestinians are doing. But they don't, you didn't see what they did. It was unprovoked. And they used that as an ex excuse to attack. The Temple Mount has been there for a long time. They have the Dome of the Rock for a long time. They didn't do this in 1967 when Israel took the Temple Mount. Yeah, that's right. So why are they doing it now? Because they're looking for an excuse to wage war. But this is what we need in order for, to hasten the days of Messiah. Yes. So sadly, many people died. And they used the Temple Mount as an excuse. But yet we cannot go pray there. They pray. They can go to the Western Wall. They can pray. And no Jew would ever stop them. But we cannot go on the Temple Mount. How about that? But you know who has to blame for that? We can blame the, uh, the, 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 the Muslims all we want. But remember, we also have our part in transgressing the covenant. And we, we take responsibility that when we do wrong, there are consequences. Now we're paying for those consequences, but we pray that God will restore our dignity and the honor of Israel to restore the Temple Mount and eventually the Temple. I don't know how it's going to be, but it will happen. So the Muslims are looking for an excuse. They don't care about the red heifers. If they did, they would go to the place where they're found right now. Right. I know where they're at. 
I'm going there in about two weeks, three weeks. Now, I think I saw the heifer has to be between three and five years of age for that sacrifice. These are 18 months old, roughly? Around there, but it all depends on the arguments of the rabbis and the, and the decision made, and the, 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 the people who make the decisions. Um, there's two right now that are qualified, and they're close to the age of, of after that, they cannot do it. So okay. I don't know how much time that will be. It could be another month or two, but there will not be a slaughter of the red heifer before Passover. It's impossible. If it happens, they're not telling us about it. They're keeping it a secret. I don't know how they're going to do it. But if they do, I'm not going to be mad. You know? Yeah. I'm not gonna, trust me, I'm not going to be upset if that happens. Check. One qualification. <laughs> I'm just going to see what's next. Right. And then I know the countdown. And then I'm waiting for the false Messiah to show up. Now, he's going to bring miracles and all that stuff. People are going to follow this guy. If you see him sitting somewhere around that altar, you run. That's not the one. That's the false Messiah. And then we're on. And get ready because then we depend on each other for that. And when you see all these things, lift up your head. Amen. For Thank your you, redemption Pastor. draweth nigh. Let's give the Lord some praise right now. Thank Rico Cortez.